Thanks, Sammy. How good was that music? Oh, my goodness. And I've lost my Bible. Did you steal my Bible? Oh, it's down there. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sam on drums tonight. Sounding good, isn't it? Uh, good to have them. I think there's a competition for who can play them louder. You or Ben. All right. <laughs> All righty. Hey, uh, so we're in this series called um, Out of Salt Shaker, and part of the reason we're doing this series is we've moved into this building, uh, which is fantastic, it's warm, it's comfortable, but we've been saying that the danger that we face as a church is we'll move in and we will get very comfortable and feel like uh, we can kind of take it easy and, um, and, and kind of feel as though this is our building. It's not our building. It's, it's a building for people to come and explore the life, love and freedom Jesus offers and we need to not get comfortable here. We have a mission to take to, uh, to our city. And so we designed uh, this series to coincide moving into the building out of the salt shaker because it would be a problem if, you know, Jesus says you are the salt of the earth and it would be a problem if we all just stayed in the salt shaker and never got out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so a couple of weeks ago we started this series and we all saw that we need to season some things like Salt Bay with the gospel of Jesus. That was week one. Week two we saw that, you know, why is it that people, uh, when they touch down in Sydney airport on a plane, why are they so anxious to get off the plane? It's because they're home and there's people to see, people they love. And this isn't our home, this world. We're waiting to go home to be with the Lord and we want others to be part of that great and glorious day when Jesus returns for us. And that ought to get us out of the salt shaker and into the world. And then last year we looked at, kind of we, we peeled back the curtain on reality and saw what is real reality and in the book of Revelation. And what we saw was at the center of absolute ultimate reality is a lion that is actually a lamb that's been slain. That's the picture we have of Jesus Christ. That's the metaphor. He's a lamb who was slain so that by his death we might be forgiven. And on the throne of heaven is not a dictator. It's the one who laid his life down for us. And we want others to come into relationship with him. So that's where we've been. And today we're going to have a look at what it means to be spirit-filled. Where do we get power to witness from Acts chapter 2? But before we get there, as we've been thinking about this, you know, this series is designed to get you out of church into the world with the gospel of Jesus. And that kind of assumes that we know what the gospel is and that you could actually articulate in words what it is that you believe about life, death, resurrection and return of Jesus. So I thought before we go any further, we should stop and rehearse the gospel together. Uh, so I'm going to ask a whole bunch of questions about what, what's good news about Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return. And um, this isn't going to be rhetorical. I'd love you to share. This is going to be a time of sharing. So, Vine Church, what is good news about the life of Jesus? Who wants to share? What's good news about, what's such good news about the life of Jesus? He lived a perfect life, and why is that good news? Because we definitely do not. Because we definitely do not. Why is that good news? Uh, as they told me to go. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> why? 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 <laughs> Does someone else want to take over there? Why is it good news that he lived a perfect life when we can't? Because? Say again? Because we need a savior? Yep. What, what else is good news about the life of Jesus Christ? He was God, uh, so we can know God, and God hasn't stayed at a distance. James? Say again? Well, we're going to get there in a sec. Let's uh, <laughs> hold on. Just talking about his life at the moment. But uh, what else about the life of Jesus? What's good news about it? Full of love. Yeah, it's, it's God's heart poured out for us. Uh, we see his love uh, more than if we just had, work, you know, God loves you. Yeah, great. But you see Jesus. Wow, he does love us. Any, what else is good news about the life of Jesus? It's God. Yeah, God come down to earth to be with us. 
Yeah, and what's good news about him being a human in a human body? Yeah, he's not over there. He's here. Yep. What else good news about him having a human body? Hey? He's relatable. Yep. What else? He, he carries our experience. He knows what it's like. He, he's able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he's been weak. Uh, anything else good news about the life of Jesus? He shows us the right way to follow the law. Um, not just ticking it off, but following the law from the heart. Fantastic. What else? He healed. He shows the power. He shows what life's meant to be. No sickness. Yeah. All right. What's good news about the death of Jesus? We are saved, <laughs> we are saved by his death. Yeah. Um, why are we saved by his death? What's good news about that? He died for our sins. What else is good news about the death? He took our place. Yeah. What else is good news? Yeah. Shows that. Well, that's the resurrection. We're going to come to that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kayla. <laughs> what else is good news? Well, we're going to get to his resurrection in a second. What? We're washed clean by his blood so that your past no longer defines you or defiles you, but you're clean in God's sight. What else is good news about the death of Jesus? It's a sign of you. I mean, there's, he can say, I love you, but he actually dies as proof. Yeah, what else is good news about his death? Yeah, 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 it's the final proof that he is the son of God. What else is good news about the death of Jesus? Yeah, he satisfies the wrath of God and he, he absorbs it so that God's wrath wouldn't burst out on us for our sin. What else is good news about the death of Jesus? He destroys Satan because Satan's accusation against you, Brandon, is you're a terrible, evil sinner. You deserve to die and be condemned by God. See, Satan has power over us by the accusation, but by dying in our place for our sins, that accusation's taken away so that Brandon is counted righteous in God's sight. So Satan's defeated. Okay, what about the resurrection of Jesus? What's good news about that? Caitlin, go. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> he shows death is not the end. Yeah, what else is good news about the resurrection? He defeats death. Yeah, it proves his holiness that death had no claim on him. Sin had no claim on him. And it proves that, he's, um, that actually what happened on the cross worked. Like if he's like, yeah, I'm going to die for you, and then disappears, it's like, well, did that work? It's like, no, it worked. God raised him from the dead. What else is good news about the resurrection of Jesus? It's... A, a new beginning, yep. New hope, yep. A new covenant, yes. What else is good news about the resurrection? The whole, well, we're going to get, I think that's <laughs> going to get there. Um, well, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, it was the Holy Spirit that raised him and gave him life again. So, and you have, the, you have the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. That's what's at work in you. That's pretty awesome. So thank you, yes. Um, and Jesus was raised physically so that our future hope is not this ethereal, ghost-like state. No, we, you are going to raise with a body that can eat and drink and sing and dance and surf and, uh, and play guitar or play drums as good as Sam. That'll be pretty good. All right, what about the ascension of Jesus? What's good news about the ascension of Jesus? The forgotten doctrine. Uh, you know, we, we say this. Uh, crucified under Pontius Pilate, was buried on the third day, he rose again, and is ascended. So what's so good news about the ascension? So there is someone representing you in the throne room of heaven and he knows your name and he's pleading your case. How awesome is that? What else is good news about the ascension? It was a, a sign that the Holy Spirit was to come. A sign that the Holy Spirit was to come. 
Yeah, remember he said it's better that I go away so that I can send the helper. If he didn't go, he wouldn't send the helper. And uh, so he sent the spirit, was that, yes, uh, because he's ascended. Uh, and now he's like a general sitting in the back room directing the state of play in our world seeking to save people. What about the return of Jesus? Why is that good news? New, he's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth. Where? What else is good news about that? We're going to get married. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, someone will love you with the purest love you'll ever have. What else is good news about? No more evil, no more death, all wiped away. What else is good news? We get, yeah, fantastic. We'll see God face to face. Anything else about the return of Jesus? Yeah, every wrong righted, every, every innocent victim vindicated, everyone charged falsely, proven innocent, um, and every tear wiped from every eye. And we'll see the Lord. Okay, that's the gospel, right? That's what we believe. And uh, it's helpful to remind ourselves of this. Be good to do this this week in your community group. Start the night by going, hey, let's rehearse the gospel. And as you do, isn't your heart warmed by hearing all the things Jesus has done for you? Uh, mine was and is the time through today. And I'm still feasting on these things that Jesus has done for us. So today we're talking about... Um, uh, power to witness, and we're looking at Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And as we just narrated the events, this is what we believe happened in history. Jesus died, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and at Pentecost he sends his spirit. And we can date this very thing. So in AD 33, on the 2nd of April, we know that he died on a cross under the authority of Pontius Pilate. Some historians uh, date it to AD 30 on the 7th of April. There are only two dates that it's possible, and it has to do with when the Jewish Passover is, because um, Jesus died at Passover at the full moon or something like that. And so we can date it, 2nd of April, AD 33. He rose again on the 4th of April. He ascended into heaven 40 days later on the 14th of May, and 10 days after that, he sent the Spirit. So we are looking at a historical event tonight on the 24th of May, AD 33, and we're looking at how Christianity went from a marginal group of men and women in an upper room hiding and scared for their lives because their leader had just been brutally murdered, how that went from that to being men and women who were the most bold people of history going out with love being persecuted, killed for the message that they were preaching. And that message took over the Roman world. So it was the greatest, largest move, movement in the Roman world 200 years later. How did that happen? It happened because of two things. They really, really, they claimed to see an alive Jesus Christ. The resurrection really happened. And the second thing is that the spirit of power, God's divine spirit came and lived and gave them power uh, and so that's what we're going to have a look at. What does it mean to be spirit-filled? If you've got your Bible, open up, and we're in Acts chapter 2. Um, I always print it for you for those who are exploring, but I encourage those of you who are Christians to bring a Bible. So if you have a look, this is how Acts 2 goes. When the day of Pentecost came, they were, they were all together in one place, that is the disciples of Jesus, not just the 12, but there are about 40 men and women. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, the key thing that I want you to think about today is what is the essential mark of a spirit-filled person? Notice the spirit comes on them and they start speaking in tongues. And many churches would say the essential mark of a spirit-filled person is they are able to speak in tongues, uh, other languages. And um, the problem with that is the Bible actually teaches the opposite. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul asks the question, do all speak in tongues? 
And it's a rhetorical question, but you're meant to answer, no, not all, only some have that gift. And he goes on, do all work miracles? No, not all. Particular people God gift differently. And the gift of tongues is not given to all. Uh, so it isn't the essential mark of a spirit-filled person. If it's not the essential mark of spirit, what is the gift of tongues? Um, we need to kind of understand this. It's mentioned in the book of Acts a couple of times and then in the book of, uh, to the letter of the Corinthians. And in Corinthians, uh, the gift of tongues seems to be a heavenly language. Uh, so a gift of tongues is a supernatural gift from the Holy Spirit where you are able to speak a language which you've never learned. That's what the gift of tongues is. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, there's a particular kind of this gift. Do you remember Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, uh, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So he says, if I speak in the tongues of angels. Now it could be he's using hyperbole. That is, wow, Toby, that sermon was a banger. That was awesome. You were like speaking the language of angels, hyperbole for that was really good. Uh, my, my daughter would say slay or something like that, right? <laughs> but the tongues of angels is you've slayed it, right? Uh, it could be hyperbole or maybe it actually is a heavenly language. Later in 1 Corinthians 14, the, uh, Paul says that um, a person may pray in a tongue and when they do their spirit prays, but their mind is unfruitful. And some Christians testify to this experience of praying to God in a language that they have not learned. They may not even understand the language that they're speaking to God, but it has some kind of benefit to them. Now, I've never experienced this. Um, I have no first-hand experience of this. Some of you have. So what are we to do with this? Well, just because I've not had an experience of it, uh, I shouldn't sit in judgment on those who do. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, don't forbid speaking in tongues, but if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. And if there are no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. So that's our practice at Vine Church. Uh, I don't know whether you speak in tongues. I don't even know whether my staff team speak in tongues. have never bothered to ask them this question. Um, and so we would happily actually have anyone come up and share a message in tongues so long as there's an interpreter or when there's a time of sharing or when there's question time, you want to ask your question in a tongue and you can find, and, sorry, this isn't a joke. It's not meant to be a joke. But uh, if you can find someone to interpret, we'd, we'd literally be open to that. Uh, we mustn't forbid it. Um, so that's, that's one version of tongues. But here's the thing, it seems to be what's going on in Acts chapter 2. It's a different kind of tongue or language uh, being used in Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit's poured out on the disciples, they don't start speaking in a heavenly language. They actually start speaking in many, many earthly languages. So pick up chapter, five, uh, chapter 2, verse 5. This is what we read. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? That is, they're from the region of Galilee in Judea which they spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, maybe a bit of Greek. They're like, how are they speaking in our language? And then look at where they're from. Uh, then how is it that each of us hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Figria, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Jew Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? 
So this is um, at Pentecost. Pentecost was a Jewish festival, a very large festival. And as a result, the Jews from all over the Mediterranean, the Middle East, they flooded back into Jerusalem because the Jews had been scattered. But they come back for major feasts. So you've got people from Rome. You've got them from Parthia and Media, which is modern-day Iran. You've got Elam and Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. Arabia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Crete, and they all come from their different regions. Maybe they speak a bit of Hebrew, maybe something else, but they have their own uh, languages back where they've come from. And they come into Jerusalem, and what's just happened in Jerusalem is Jesus lived this perfect life. He died our death. He rose again and has ascended into heaven. And the disciples of Jesus, men and women who are there in Jerusalem, they want their brothers and sisters to know the Messiah has come. So they start speaking to them, and the Holy Spirit descends, and they speak, and the Holy Spirit gives them the supernatural gift of being able to speak the languages of their native regions. And it's incredible, because Jesus died, he's risen, he's ascended. What is the, what, what's the job now? The job now is to make that message available for the rest of the world. So the first miracle the Holy Spirit does is give them the ability to speak the language to pass on the message so that they get out of the salt shaker and into the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. Now here's the question. That is a supernatural miracle that the Holy Spirit has done by giving them this other language. Could he do this again today? Of course he could do this today. Imagine you're traveling in, um, in Asia and you come across uh, this Chinese guy and uh, you sit down, he can't understand English and you want to share the gospel with him. He speaks Mandarin and boom, the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to speak Mandarin so that you might be able to share the gospel with this guy. Could God do that? Heck yeah, he could do that. Has God promised to do that? Unfortunately not. And that's why we send missionaries to language school before we send them overseas. But gee, it'd be cool if God did uh, do that. Could he do that? Of course he could. But never mistake a could with a promise. Just because he could doesn't mean he's promised to do this. Uh, But that's what's going on in this chapter. God gives them the ability to speak other languages that they haven't learned so that the gospel goes out. And here's the thing. The ability to do that is not the essential mark of a spirit Christian. If you don't speak in tongues, I don't. Do I have the Holy Spirit? Do you? Yes. Well, then the question is, well, how would you know that you have the Holy Spirit? What are the essential marks of the Spirit? I'm going to give you three, um, uh, and uh, here are three from um, two from the, the rest of the New Testament and one from this passage. And the first one is this, uh, the essential mark of of that the Holy Spirit's in your life is if you have faith in Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 12 says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if you call Jesus your Lord, and don't just say it, but you mean it, that you place your life under the Lordship of Jesus, you embrace him as the one who rules your life, and you follow him and you trust him, that is the evidence that the Spirit is at work in your life. And uh, I take it if you've done that, God's at work in your life. You're filled with the Spirit. Praise God. The second um, sign that the Spirit is filling someone is that they live a holy life. So in Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul says, So I say walk by the Spirit. How would you know if someone were walking with the Holy Spirit? Well, he tells you, walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. So what is the distinguishing mark of a person walking by the Spirit of God? They don't give in to their old, selfish, sinful nature. They're at war with that. They don't make peace with sin in their life. They may stumble, but they repent, they turn, they cling to Jesus, and they ask him for help and power to say no. So they don't gratify the desires of the flesh, and they walk in a life of love. So notice that. But the fruit of the Spirit is... So the fruit, what's the evidence? What's the overflow of a person indwelt by the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit's love and joy and peace and forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self 
control. How would you tell if a person is filled by the Spirit? Well, those things would be in abundance. Love, joy, peace, patience. Now, when I hear some people speak about a Spirit-led church and wanting to be in a Spirit-led church, I think they mean that I think they mean a creative church or an emotional church or a spontaneous church or a dramatic church. Now, I love creativity. I love spontaneity. I love um, emotions. I love the dramatic. But God doesn't tell me that those things are the sign of the Spirit. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know that the pad that we play during the music? Um, I heard someone <laughs> I heard someone call it the, the sound of the Holy Spirit recently. <laughs> it really irritated me. I don't know. Was it someone in the front row? No, it was morning church. <laughs> it re- um, and no, it isn't. Do we have the sound? I, Jeremy told me not to get them to play it. We don't have it. Anyway, it goes like this. <laughs> hey! <laughs> the Holy Spirit just. <laughs> that is not the sound of the Holy Spirit, right? That is an electronic sound which someone created, which makes our music sound amazing. But that is not, nor is the smoke machines or fancy lighting. Now, that's a joke, but some people really think the oh, Holy Spirit's not here unless we have those things. That is absolutely ridiculous. You see, what is a person who is being led by the Spirit of Jesus doing? What is the Spirit, what is the Spirit of God leading us to? He's leading us to become like Jesus. And what does Jesus look like? He's full of love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, self-control. And so when you're a Spirit-filled person, you're becoming like Jesus. You know, it's no wonder that the Spirit of God is usually known as the Holy Spirit. Not just because He is holy in His character, but because His goal for you is that you'd become a holy person, a person who is wholehearted in their devotion for Jesus Christ. That you'd be like Him. Not just, hmm, right? Uh, So there are the two Uh, signs of a spirit-filled person. And the third sign is back in Acts chapter 2. The third mark of a spirit-filled person is they prophesy. Now, um, by the way, we are going to do question time after this. Uh, And question time, if you go to slido, sli.do, and the code is vine, you can ask a question on any of this. I realize tonight, tongues, prophecy, maybe there are some questions on this stuff. (laughs) The third... An essential mark of a spirit-filled Christian is that they prophesy. Now, what's interesting is when Peter stands up after the rushing wind, the tongues of fire, them speaking all of these other languages, and people think, whoa, what's going on here? He stands up and he explains what's going on by quoting the prophet Joel. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, Peter stands up and, and quotes Joel saying, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. That's what he is saying is happening in Jerusalem when they start speaking other languages. And my problem is I think we focus so much on the manner of their communication. Wow, they're speaking in other languages. What does that mean? Ah! And we miss the the message that they're speaking. So come back to Acts 2, verse 4. Pick it up again. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. Notice that connection. Filled, they start talking. And you'll see that over and over in the Acts. Uh, in Acts, They began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all those who are speaking Galilean, how then are each of us hearing them? in our own native language, in Iranian, in Iraqi, in, in, in Greece, Greek, whatever. We hear them, and here's the key thing, declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. And I think we get too excited about the manner of their communication, speaking another language, and we miss the message. See, what are they talking about? The wonders of God, the mighty works of God in salvation. So 
They've just seen Jesus die, rise, ascend to heaven. What do they want to talk about? They want everyone to know that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who is able to save us from their sins. And the Jews come into Jerusalem for Pentecost. The Spirit descends, and the first thing they do, they start talking. Because that's what a Spirit-filled person does. The essential mark of a Spirit-filled person is that they declare the wonders of God. They, they don't stop talking about the life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ. They are joyfully obsessed with the gospel. And they just start talking in many languages. And that's why the people think they're drunk. Amazed and perplexed, pick this up, they ask one another, What's, what does this mean? They're seeing the disciples speak languages they've never learned. And the Jews in Jerusalem, they didn't care about the nations. They, they, they didn't go to Spanish school because they were thinking about having some sexy trip to Spain. No, they were very parochial. And so they go, so some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had a bit too much wine, right? Now, I, um, I remember when I first drunk uh, alcohol. I was 16. I was at, a, at my brother's friend's 18th birthday. And uh, there were... Uh, there were guys there, all my brother's mates were there, and there were girls. And when I, <laughs> when I was a teenager, I was so awkward around girls. I was so scared of them. I'd freeze up. I'd go clammy. I'd get into conversation with a girl. I wouldn't know what to say. I'd say something stupid. Any guys relate to this? No one's going to admit it. <laughs> I, anyway, I hated it. I remember meeting my now wife at my year 10 formal, and she was sitting across the table from me. I didn't speak to her the whole night. I was too scared. <laughs> right. Anyway, so there I am, uptight, you know. And anyway, I'm at this party, 16. My brother's friends come and give me a couple of bottles of beer. And oh my goodness, it was a miracle. After drinking two bottles of beer, any girl, I'd go up and have a chat to. My jokes were hilarious. Uh, I lost all my inhibitions. And um, I think in that way, they make them, they, they think they've had too much wine. Because here are the disciples, they're talking about being loyal to the one who was crucified. And, uh, and, and they're joyfully talking in lots of different languages, ecstatically, about what Jesus has done. And they think they are drunk. They lost their fear of man, they, they lost their inhibitions. They no longer were hiding in some upper room, shaking. Do you remember Peter at Jesus' um, arrest? A 14-year-old servant girl comes up to him and says, are you following him? He's like, no, no. <laughs> you know, he's absolutely terrified. And yet on this day, the Spirit comes and he stands up in front of a couple of thousand people and in the audience of those who killed Jesus, and at the end of his sermon, you remember what he says to them? He says, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Messiah. He just told the religious leaders of that day that they killed the Messiah. <laughs> He's just like, yep, yeah, come on, bring it on. That's what happens when the Spirit comes. He's lost his inhibition. He's able to face his fears. He is so secure in God Jesus is the prince of life. What can they do to me? They kill me, I go to be with Jesus. So what? They lose all of their fear. And that's why they mistake them for being drunk. That's the similarity. But there is a difference. Being full of the Spirit is different to being full of alcohol. And the difference is, you know, um, alcohol is a depressant. So it, um, it doesn't make you necessarily sad, it can make you happy, but uh, alcohol depresses your brain function. The way alcohol makes you uninhibited is by, um, is by making you oblivious to what's really going on. Uh, and so you lose, uh, you, you enter oblivion, you're just at this state, and you don't really care what people think. Because you've been obliviated. You're just in oblivion. Ah. So alcohol makes you fearless by making you stupid. The Holy Spirit is the very opposite. He makes you face your fears, not by making you stupid, 
but by making you intelligent, he helps you see what real reality is. Ah, oh, Jesus is on the throne. He's the center of the universe, right? They don't think he is, but I know he is. So what if I'm, this person thinks I'm an idiot? Who's on the throne at the center of all reality? I'm gonna side with him rather than this group, and so I'm gonna have the courage to speak to this group of people uh, the fact that I'm a Christian and that they should consider the claims of Jesus as well. See, the Holy Spirit makes you more aware of reality. Alcohol makes you less aware of reality. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of Jesus. So you want joy in life? You want, a, you want respite for your, from your anxieties? You want to be less controlled by what others think of you? You could drink alcohol. Uh, it'll just make you oblivious to all of that, and then the next day you'll be oblivious, or whatever the opposite of oblivious is, right? You'll see it. Um, or you could rely on the Spirit and fill your heart with thanksgiving for what God has done for you, and from that you will become a more secure person and less worried about the future because God's got it, and less concerned about what people think of you because the God of heaven, you know what he thinks of you. So here is the sign of a spirit-filled Christian. They speak boldly, joyfully about what Jesus has done for them, and that's what prophecy is. We kind of think prophecy is predicting the future, and that's a very rare thing in the Bible. But the Bible's often speaking about prophecy, and all it means is testifying to the wonders of God. That's the definition we're given in Acts chapter 2. And that's the, that's the if you were spirit-filled, how would you know? Well, you bow before the Lordship of Jesus, you live a life of love, saying no to sin, and thirdly, you speak about the wonders, the mighty acts of God that he has done in your life and in history, that's the sign a person is filled with the Spirit. Not that they can speak in tongues. That's a certain gift. Not all have it. But all Christians have love for Jesus in their heart, and they want others to know him. And that's why if you read the rest of Acts, that just keeps happening over and over. So in Acts chapter 4, Peter is arrested by the Jewish leaders. He's put in jail for a night. The next morning, he's hauled before the whole Sanhedrin, which, what, uh, a month or two earlier had killed Jesus, and they get him up to answer why he's preaching the resurrection of Jesus, and he tells them. He doesn't shrink back. He doesn't hide. And they say, stop talking. He says, judge between uh, heaven and earth whether it's right for us to, to obey you or God. We're going to obey God. <laughs> he's just like unflinchingly testifying to Jesus. And then in Acts chapter 6, one of my favorite characters in all the Bible, Stephen. Are there any Stephens here? Good name. So I'm not going to mock you if you are a Stephen. <laughs> You're never too sure, though, are you? Uh, but Stephen, you remember Stephen? Full of faith in the Holy Spirit. That's what we're told in Acts 6. And then what happens to him a chapter later? He gets up and he preaches the longest sermon in the book of Acts, testifying to the mighty acts of God in history. And at the end of it, the Jewish leaders, the Apostle Paul, uh, at that time, they kill him. They stone him to death. And he knows it's coming. And he keeps, keeps declaring the wonders of God. It's not that he wasn't, didn't have fear. Don't get that from tonight. It's not that the Holy Spirit will take away the fear. The Holy Spirit will give you something that enables you to face that fear and push through it. And it is, to, to be honest, I get really scared talking about Jesus. I like, I, personally, I find preaching in a church to the choir very easy. This isn't that hard. But when I'm out in the world at meeting new people, and the you know, first question they ask is, what's your job? It's like, I find it really hard. I was shy as a teenager. I'm shy as an adult. And I find it very hard. And the Holy Spirit won't take away my shyness or my fearfulness but he will give me love for people. 
and their deepest spiritual needs so that I actually start talking about the wonders of God that has captured my heart. And if you're a Christian, that's true for you. So get out of the salt shaker, right? Uh, I like what Ray Ortland, an American pastor, says. He says, so what's the proof that the Spirit is being poured out on us? The voice of the church rings with prophetic clarity. The people of God are no longer passive, intimidated, unresponsive, or uncertain. They're no longer preoccupied with themselves, their convenience, their comfort. They're no longer complaining, whining, griping. Instead, they become outspoken in God's praises and gospel truth, declaring the wonders of God. So are you a spirit-filled Christian? I don't know how you would have answered that. Uh, What's the sign of you being a spirit-filled Christian? I don't know how you would have answered that before tonight. But um, here's the test. If you've been drenched from on high, you will believe in the Lord Jesus, place yourself under his authority, seek to repent of sin, live a life of love, and you won't stop speaking about the wonders he has done in saving you. That's what a spirit-filled Christian looks like. Okay, the second thing we're going to do tonight is um, I want to just get a little bit practical, and this, that was the long point. This, this is the funner point. Um, how might we live this out? I realize the last couple of weeks, it's been more kind of big picture, a lot of more convictions. Who are we? What is God doing in the world? But I want to kind of land today with something a little bit more practical. So how might we live this out? First thing is, here's a report which McCrindle Research put out every couple of years. McCrindle is one of the largest uh, demographic researchers in Australia today. And Mark McCrindle, he's a Christian guy, and he publishes this report, Australia's Changing Spiritual Climate Every Couple of Years. And in it, here was one of the questions he asked last year. If you were personally invited by a friend or family member to attend church, how likely is it that you would attend? Now look at this. 16% of people are extremely likely if you invited them to church. Another 18% are very likely. Another 16% somewhat likely, and another 18% slightly likely. Only 33% of people, you have no hope of ever getting to church. But what's that? Is that uh, 66% of people, you have a chance of inviting them to church. And notice, what is that like? Uh, I can't do the maths on the top of the 32. 32% of people are very likely or extremely likely to come to Now, is that, do you feel that? Because I don't. I'm way more pessimistic when I'm in conversations with my neighbor about, uh, you know, I, I'm scared to bring up. But there is an amazing amount of openness in our community to talking about things like faith and Jesus and God. Although people are ticking no religion, what they're actually saying is, I don't identify with any denomination or any organized religion. They're not saying, I've stopped believing in God. You have an opportunity. And God's Spirit's with you. Get out of the salt shaker. Now, I want to have a look at this in a little bit more detail because if you break those stats down into the generations, you know, how do you reckon this would uh, fly? So uh, I want you to have a guess. Uh, the percentage extremely or very likely to attend a church service if they're personally invited. Which of the generations do you think would be more likely to attend a church service than uh, the others if you personally invited them? Who wants to hazard a guess? Which generation most likely, which least likely? Hey? Gen Z most or least? Most likely? Why do you say that, Sam? Uh, I don't know. I mean, like, I think young people are very open. Young people are open. Cool. And least likely? Hey? Oh, I Gen, X. Gen X. All right. Do we have any Gen Zs here? No. So we're all bunch. Oh, kind of, maybe. What, what I Gen don't Gen know. Gen, Gen Z. No, I'm, I'm a millennial. I don't. <laughs> I'm Gen Y. I think 97. Anyone? Okay, one Gen Z over there. A couple of Gen Zers. Cool. Great to have you here, guys. <laughs> Okay, have a look at this. Okay, 44% of Gen Zers are 
very likely or extremely likely to attend church if you invited them. That is crazy. And Gen Y, this is my age group, 39% of people. 39%. That's for every 10 people you meet, four of them, you have a very good chance of inviting them to a Christian event where they will hear about Jesus. Now, that, those stats, just compare your attitudes, your feelings, your apprehensiveness in going out into society and sharing your faith with actually the reality. People are much more open than you give them credit. The problem is the bloody Gen Xs because <laughs> they control the media right now and they are very closed. They aren't very open to Christianity and they keep writing stories and publishing movies which are anti, uh, anti-faith. But actually, Gen Y and Gen Z, the opportunities are immense. Now, how would you go about having these conversations? Well, I like what Andy Stanley says. He says, whenever you hear one of these three knots, this is your opportunity to invite them along to church. If they say, you know what, I'm not going well, so I'm not going so well right now, or hey, I wasn't prepared, I was not prepared for this, I, um, or I'm not from around here, Andy Stanley says they are the three moments when people are much, much more open to exploring new things and giving things a chance. So if you hear someone saying, oh, not going well, not prepared for this, or I'm not from around here, that's your opportunity to invite them to cross the pain barrier. There's always a pain barrier in talking about Jesus. You have to embrace the pain barrier. You have to be a little bit awkward. You have to come across a little bit drunk, right? Drunk people say crazy things. And you as a Christian, you have to go against the what what is socially acceptable because it's not socially acceptable to talk about uh, your faith. And sometimes you just got to lightly cross that barrier and put the bait out there, particularly when you hear one of these three knots. Now, final thing I want to do for you is I want to play a short little video by Becky Pippett. She wrote a book in the 80s called Out of the Salt Shaker. Brilliant book, worth reading. And uh, she's in like her late 50s, probably her 60s now. Beautiful Christian woman, great heart to share the gospel with people who don't know Jesus. And I found uh, this short little video that she talks about how do you get into a conversation about Jesus, very helpful. So we're gonna watch that right now. One of the things that is important is understanding the use of questions in a conversation. First thing you need to find out is what is this person's passion? What is their interest? What are they really passionate about? And we don't do this as a trick. We don't do it manipulatively. But we really ask questions. We're curious. We want to know. They're a doctor. Yeah, how did you get into medicine? What made you um, decide? What is your area of specialization? As And again, this has to be sincere. If it's a trick so you can slip in the gospel, it's not going to work. They can smell it. But as you're asking, let's use the example of a doctor, all right, so you're asking questions. One skill that we need is to ask the, um, well, how would I call it, the thought-provoking question, the issue question. For example, remembering now we're dealing with their area of interest. How do you give hope to patients who are terminal? All right, now we're dealing with their area of interest, but that's a thoughtful, reflective question. I find if you can ask that question, a God question really is pretty easy. Uh, do you think it's possible that, um, that, there, that this life isn't the only life? And we're talking about how do we get into conversations now. We're not talking about how do I then give them the gospel. I was talking to a, um, uh, a student who was studying art in England. <clears throat> and um, or this might have been America, actually. I think it was America. And I, yeah, it was, it was America. I said, what's your major? She said, art. I said, what kind of art do you like? What do you do? And she was telling me all the different things that she likes to do. And then I said, 
How do you think, where do you think we get our ability to appreciate what is beautiful and what is ugly? I said, I had a professor, a biology professor at university, who began every lecture saying, man is nothing more than a meaningless piece of protoplasm, a fortuitous concourse of atoms. Every day, that's how we began the lecture. And I said, do you think a fortuitous concourse of atoms would have the ability to appreciate beauty? She said, I can't believe I've never asked myself that question. She said, I'm going to make a living at creating beauty, and I've never asked myself, where, does, where do we get that ability? She said, well, where do you think we get the ability? What do you think? And I said, do you think it's possible there is an invisible artist who created us from where, from whence beauty comes. In other words, just asking questions about their area of interest can actually lead into a God question. So helpful, right? So helpful. All she's talking about is how to have a conversation, right? It's not... It's not rocket, it shouldn't, we, there should be a class in high school about how to have a conversation with someone, right? Because we're all rubbish at, about, uh, rubbish at it. She's just telling you how to be human. And even if you're not a Christian here tonight, you ought to actually value this. Because surely you're able to see uh, that any healthy society should be able to talk about what they deeply believe. And we're living in a time where we, you're not able to do that. Actually, that's private. Don't ever talk about it. And so just notice what she said here. She goes, you want to start with general interest questions and then spiral around them into specific interest questions, issue questions, and then God questions. This is just training in how to have a conversation. So here's the example she used. General question for a doctor, what made you go into medicine? Two Sams? <laughs> specific question. What's your area? Why did you choose it? What are the challenges? So this is just any com this is what you ought to be doing in any conversation, right? You're just trying to get to know them. Okay, general start in the big picture. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I'm taking an interest in you. Specific question. Then issue. Ah, oh, how do you give hope to patients who are terminal? And that's the harder question to come up with. And then she said, as soon as you've asked that question, it's not so hard at that point to bring up a God question, which is what hope would it give you if we knew that God is real and there's a life beyond this one? Problem is, um, I can't give you a list of questions to ask every possible person in the world. But you've got to be a lover of people, genuinely interested in them and how they think, think what makes them tick, uh, so that you might draw them into conversation. You're a spirit-filled person. God has sent you out into the world with a message and you're not on your own. God's with you in this process and he longs for you to be of use in pointing people, bringing people from death to life. And as a result, you've got to get out of the salt shaker. It's nice in here. It's comfortable in here. It's safe in here. But you need to get out into the bad, big bad world with the good news of Jesus because it holds the promise of life and love and freedom for people. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth uh, with all its danger, that we might um, come to know the life, love and freedom that you have for us. And we ask that you might put a rocket under us, that we might go out boldly talking about the mighty acts of your salvation. And give us wisdom and skill as we do that. Keep us from being the arrogant know-it-all Christian. Help us to do it with love and gentleness and wisdom that people would know that we deeply care about them. Keep us from pushing people and imposing upon people what they're unwilling to talk about. But help us to find opportunities to draw people out to talk about more things that are meaningful in life. And give us boldness and joy as we do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.